This is from Jesse Lee Cottrell says Preller is the common denominator in all of our failures. It's not all on Bob, 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 uh, sister <laughs> able to hold these players accountable for not playing fundamental baseball. Well, I, I agree with almost everything you say there. I mean, this is Preller's franchise, his, his executives, his choice of manager, the fourth one that he's gone through his roster, his contracts, his philosophy in terms of whether they're playing money ball or whatever you want to call it. So I, I think it's on him. And in terms of Melvin, I want to see Melvin publicly tougher on these players. They're earning the big bucks. If it doesn't go right, they need to be held accountable. And to me, within the organization, there seems to be a lack of accountability right now based on where they are and the fact that nobody seems alarmed. Well, I think behind the closed doors in the clubhouse, oh, I'm sure there's there's some it, there's some heat there, you know, and guys are getting frustrated. And maybe fingers are being pointed. But but Melvin is pretty experienced and he doesn't want to throw his guys under the bus publicly. You, you kind of can see that in a lot of his postgame pressers. But sometimes he does get angry. And the few, the few times that he did get angry, he got a positive result. But then we quickly went back into the tank again. So, you know, accountability for for uh, Melvin. I mean, I don't know what else he could really do other than, you know, if it's carrot and stick, he's got to use the stick more. Or he tells them the dugout and clubhouse lineup cards, mine, stop interfering. Ah, okay. There you go. That's not, that's not a bad idea either. Okay. On we go. Next question. Okay. We got a bunch here. Let's, let's see. Uh, we got, uh, John Hopkins. He says replacing Melvin with Schilt is a lot more probable than trading off a player. Matt Williams wasn't able to handle Bryce Harper in a start studded lineup in Washington and was let go after two years. I concur with all that. And of course, Matt has been fighting this cancer situation. So I don't even know if he is really up to the rigors and the demands of what a major league manager would be. You know, Schultz, there's never been an explanation why you would blow that guy out of St. Louis after three really good successful seasons. Looks like they made a real mistake there. Look at where the Cardinals are in the standing, and they've got stars. They got Arenado, and they got Goldschmidt, and they, they picked up Contreras, and they're not a complete team either. They got problems, but it's awful radical to fire a manager in midstream unless, unless you feel – uh, that, that the players are just walking all over Melvin and they're stopped listening, et cetera. And Schilt is, excuse the quote, he's a red ass. He can really be <laughs> tough on players. Yeah. It was in St. Louis. So maybe there needs to be a leadership chemistry change there. Well, you remember when Andy Green was the manager and the players did give up on him. And so that made sense where they kind of hit the eject button in September. But um, yeah, I just, I just think it, it's hard to get rid of Melvin. I mean, to your point, they don't have much, many options. You know, it's not like you can wheel and deal and trade guys. Preller is at the end of the line for getting another manager. There's not going to be another manager under AJ Preller unless some miracle happens. They win the world series and, and then Preller is reanointed as the, um, as the rock star. If they get rid of Melvin Preller's done in my opinion. Okay. On we go. Next question. Okay. So let's go here to, Manny. And he says, I think the Diamondbacks winning the division and the Padres missing the playoffs should lead to a fire sale this offseason. Well, you're not going to fire sale the roster because you gave them all that money and a, a whole pile of these contracts are untradeable. You got a lot of age in that pitching staff. So I don't know that walking out in the front corner with a sign that says Jude Darvish is available makes very much sense because I don't know that you get fair value. Snell is a walk free agent. He's pitching his life out right now. So he'll go on the open market. But again, maybe he owes loyalty here because they were loyal to him with all the crap starts for three straight years. I just don't know that we're going to have a fire sale here because I don't think they can move very many of the people. What's alarming to me is there's nothing at AAA, you know, and there's hardly anything at AA San Antonio. And that means that, I mean, there's no doubt they got some young players at Lake Elsinore, but pal, that's like in another solar system. They're not ready to come to <laughs> yeah, the major right. leagues at this point in time. So what you have is what's going to have to get you to the playoffs or what you have is going to have to have bounce back years next year. Cause I don't think you can move those guys. And on top of all that, you got the luxury tax and they don't want to go over this next tier in the luxury tax 
because that wipes out draft picks and that wipes out international signing money. So they made a commitment. All the chips get pushed to the table this year. We'll pay the tax this year. And, but we can't, you can't do that three years in a row. It's just, it, I mean, look, the Dodgers did it and the Dodgers said, we're stepping back. We're not going to continue to do this. And the Yankees did it for a long time. Red Sox did it when they were the evil empire. <laughs> they stepped back too. Mm-hmm. You can't, you can't do it from the San Diego perspective. So. I, I think th- th- it's going to be, I mean, can you imagine if the Padres try to trade uh, Manny Machado? I mean, it, it would be impossible. I mean, they'd have to eat like two thirds of that contract, at least. Um, you know, they could trade Juan Soto because he still has a little bit of value, you know, in, in terms of. Oh, I think he's got significant value. Yeah. But you traded five hot young prospects to get him and now you're going to move him. I don't think you're going to get five prospects right. back in return. And I think that's, again, I think Preller would be hesitant to do that because he would be admitting failure and then it'd be one more step of him beginning to push out the door. So I don't see a fire sale coming. I just don't see that happening. I think they're stuck, you know, with these big name players. Now, one thing I think will happen that you can count on that'll be a big improvement is when Luis Campusano comes back because he can hit. And Sanchez got off to a great start, but he went back into the tank. Sanchez Nola. is Sanchez. Yeah. Occasional home run, dude hitting 202. Now he has thrown more guys out on the bases than the other guys did collectively, but Sanchez is Sanchez. Right. And Nolo, I don't know what the hell happened to him. So Campusano, I think, is going to be a nice, you know, boost to the bottom half of that order. Um, and and then we just need these guys to turn it around. But I, I just don't see a fire sale happening. We move on. You got questions. We got answers. If you agree with us, great. If you don't, too bad for you. Go ahead, John. Hey, Rome loves Dan. He says, I heard someone's coin the Strand Diego moniker. Oh, does that replace Slam Diego? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, I don't. Th- I don't think my guys Don Orsillo or Mud Grant will be using Strand Diego on TV. No, nah, I don't think so. No, but I think Padres Twitter is using it a lot. So. On we go. On we go. So Emmanuel Nahara says, "I blame the team's scoreboard director for showing a crying Kershaw <laughs> after the Padres beat the Dodgers on May 5th. Since then, the Padres have been struggling." Well, you can gloat all you wish, but you're correct. I don't know what the what the one loss record is since the Clayton Kershaw crying episode is, but I bet it I bet it's way below 500 at that point in time. So, uh, you know, win with class. That's how about just winning first of all, and then win with class. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I I I thought that was great when they did that because it's just because baseball is it's a sport, but it's also entertainment. Mm-hmm. You know, and we get excited and we like a lot of the smack talking and that makes it fun. And we got Padre fans are desperate to be, you know, on par rivals with the Dodgers. And so it just backfired in their face. A lot of people think it's bad karma. Let me ask you a question. Being a uh, deported Giants fan from the Bay Area, mm-hmm. I recall when Barry Bonds was in San Francisco and was hitting all the home runs and looked like Hulk Hogan. Yeah. And was obviously juiced. Were you the guy down the left field line at Petco Park one night? I looked up right before the first pitch of the game with the Giants, and there was a dude on a left field foul line held up this big placard and it had the giant colors all around it, and it had a hypodermic needle. <laughs> Were you th- was that you? <laughs> was that me? <laughs> no, you know, well, my history is, is I, I grew up a Giants fan as a little kid and in the 70s when they were terrible. So I also rooted for the A's because they were pretty good then. But by the time I got to, the, and I came to college here in San Diego in the 80s, by the time I got to the late 80s, like 89 is when my allegiance began to shift. And, uh, and so the whole Barry Bonds era was sort of, you know, not really my Giants, but still Bonds, fabulous player. But yeah, the dude was on the juice. Uh, but isn't it funny how there are all these double standards, you know, is that po- Giants fans still love Bonds. They don't care that he was on the juice. Everyone else hates him. Outside of area code 415, he has no friends. It's exactly. You know, and so, and the same thing is true here in San Diego. You know, we love Manny Machado, but everywhere he goes, you know, he's the devil incarnate. You know, you just gave me and all the people watching on live stream an answer, non-answer. You <laughs> did not answer the question. Are you the guy? No, it wasn't me. The- no, it wasn't me. <laughs> okay. On we go. Next question. Okay. Um, all right. So the, let's go here to, to oh gosh, how about this one here? This is uh, from Carlos. He says, does Preller pitch? Does Melvin pitch? Players aren't playing at the capability that we are used to seeing. 
the word of the day. If you ever watch Sesame Street, they start the program says the word of the day. Yeah. Substandard. <laughs> here's your there's your one word response to it is on the players. But the manager has to has to drive these guys. And whether that's focus, that's intensity, whether that's aggressiveness on the bases, aggressiveness at the plate, changing the batting order. Some of that comes from Melvin's corner of the dugout, and that has to be part of the equation to fix substandard. I'm still stuck on the idea of substandard as a Sesame Street word. I mean, you, you're probably like Oscar the Grouch. Yes, you're, thank you. <laughs> I am right now. I'm the cookie monster, I think. Go ahead. Okay. Let's go to some of these social media comments. We've got a lot, ton of them here, and they're really good. So um, let's get these folks involved. And let's start here. Um, and this is from Robert Wood. He says, come on, dude. It's not even halfway through the season yet. Let's give us some time. Are you a fan of the team or you just want to sit there and pick them apart? Uh, what what does the scoreboard say? What's the record? 37 and 41? Yeah. What What's the record in extra innings? What's the record in one-run games? What are the metrics offensively? I'd much rather be talking about a 12-game lead at the All-Star break and everybody behind me. Well, yeah. running uphill rather than the Padres having to run uphill. You can be a fan. I have no problem, Woody, with your opinion about the Padres. But at the end of the day, they are who they are. That's what the scoreboard says. You are what your record says you are. Yeah. Thank you, Bill Parcells. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in the first month of the season, we were saying, okay, it's early. And then we got into May and we're like, I don't know here. In June, you're like, this is ridiculous. And oh my God, it's almost July now. So yeah, we need to be, you know, sending off the, 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 uh, all the warning signs because they need to fix this. Well, and I will say this, they should go in and sweep Pittsburgh so that, you know, then they're going to get Cincinnati, which is playing out of its mind with all of its kids. Maybe these kids will wake up uh, in Cincinnati at Great American Ballpark and look and say, holy cow, that's Tatis and that's Soto and that's Machado in the batting order. And then maybe their pitchers are going to get a case of the shakes. You know, maybe the Padres will be able to put a little bit of a winning streak together here. Because when they come home, they get the Angels. They get Otani. Uh -huh. And they get Hunter Renfro. And they get Trout. And those guys are banging the ball pretty well. And Nevin's got them playing really street ball, really down and dirty grind it. And they scored oh. 25 runs like a few days ago. Um, yeah, so I don't know. The Padres are a tease. You know, they'll win one or two in a row, and you're like, hey, we're turning the corner, and then they lose three in a row. Okay, we move on. Give us a couple more social comments. Okay, this is from Steve Cabrera, and he says, I don't think this has anything to do with the front office. They, they put a team that could compete on the field. What more do you want? I don't see any fight from the players. They get down, and it seems like they are just waiting for something big to happen. I think the manager doesn't fit with the team. Seems like a lot of messing around, smiling, and no one ready to do the dirty work to win games. I had a baseball scout email me. We were just talking about the Padres, and I have guys that give me their opinions, quote, anonymously behind the curtain. And he made a comment to me that kind of blew me away. When they got battered by the Dodgers in the last series, Padre guys were laughing in the dugout. And they're getting, I mean, they're getting nailed by the Dodgers and guys are looking at each other joking. And he said, that to me is a really bad sign, which then made me think the other phrase that I've used a couple of times now on our podcast, I got my money. Did you get yours? <laughs> so I had a baseball scout tell me that. And these guys pay attention to intangible things. And I don't know, I'll ask Padre fans out there, are you offended guys horsing around in the dugout as they're in fourth place and losing games to bad teams consistently. Yeah. I mean, that's a legitimate beef. I mean, because it goes to their, their character and their will to win, you know, do they want to be a winner or do they want to be a joker? And, you know, I think the results play out, right? On we go, on we go. So uh, this is from Skip Kelly. He says, Lee, my take on this is the Padres lead the world in stylish, cocky young players who have had, have had all the cool handshakes, et cetera, but they have zero leadership to tell all the cool guys to knock it off and uh, knock off the hot dogging and play hard. Their effort to score runs from third with less than two outs is a major sign of a lack of fundamental baseball. Well, I concur with you. I don't have any problem with the sombrero or the swag chain and the excitement because that's going on in a lot of dugouts in baseball. And I think that's kind of cool. I think fans like that uh, when their team does well and, and gets excited. 
But I, I question, quote, it, where's the where's the down and dirty leadership? Where's the guy that's going to stand up, pick up the flag and say, you follow me. We're going to go get this done. We haven't seen it a year ago when they forged their way into the playoffs. Petco Park was like an insane asylum and the players were responding to what was coming out of the stands. I mean, it was electric and you could connect the dots. We haven't seen that at all, even when the fans support. And all the sellouts were really, really impressive. And now those sellouts have been replaced by booze. Uh, there's something not right. And I don't know if it's if it's player leadership or it's manager's demand of leadership. Something's not right. Yeah, some of the players have to step up. You know, we got Nelson Cruz, you know, and Matt Carpenter, these veterans that we thought could provide that leadership in the clubhouse. It makes me wonder if maybe they've gone quiet. Vocal. You need vocal leadership, followed up, obviously, by productivity. Right. Okay. A couple more here before we close out fans form. This was a good one. This is from Jacob Northrow. He says, it was more fun when we had guys like Solarte and Amarista and Everth Cabrera and Corey Spangerberg go out there. <laughs> At least you knew what to expect from them. This season has just been heartbreaking. It's like watching a Chargers game. Oh, I, won't, I won't go that far. <laughs> but, you know, he, he, he raised a, an interesting statement about Guys, Spangenberg, I got to know him really well. I really liked him. You know the old Sesame Street cartoon character, Pigpen? Or the Peanuts. That's Peanuts, yeah. Peanuts, Pigpen. Yeah. yeah. That's who Spangenberg was. Really? He had dirt on the front of his uniform every minute of every game and diving and all that. Yeah. I don't see much of that. Outside of Tatis and maybe Kim, mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of guys – grinding the way, you know, Spangenberg did. Spangenberg is just a utility guy. And, you know, so he gets 10 years in and he plays 103 games and sometimes he starts and bulk of the time he's off the bench as a pinch hitter, pinch runner, defensive replacement. But there's something from a persona standpoint that when you have that type of pig pen guy on your roster that creates an aura that leads to other guys to start to play like that, I don't see much of that. And this year's Friars team. Well, that's what Tatis is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. and that's what he did when he first came to this team. Um, but yeah, I don't know. You go back to those teams of Amarista and Spangenberg. They were all nice guys, the lovable Padres, but we had such low expectations then. And they were always a fourth or a fifth place team, except for 2010. They kind of surprised us a little. But uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm frustrated with this lineup today, but I would much prefer to be where we are now than where we were back when Amarista was our starting shortstop. Because where we are now, we still with the Fab Four think that maybe we could play in October. The other guys, our season would end September 30th. Yeah. That's the way it is. Okay, exactly. let's do one more here before we close out fans form. Okay, this is from Scott um, Bezai, and he says, this is on Bob Melvin. How is Preller even remotely at fault here? All he did was assemble the best players available to our collective amazement and praise. Melvin has been... Uh, has not been able to win with an A roster. Goodbye, Bo Mel, according to him. Yeah. I, I don't think they're going to hit the eject button on Bob Melvin because if they do, then it's a terrible indictment on Preller because from Bud Black through Bob Melvin, that would have then been four managers that were here mm -hmm. that he got rid of. And I'll just, I'll ask Scott, are you going to trust that general manager? to conduct another managerial search and believe he could bring the right guy in after what we've seen. I mean, this is the same group that refused to interview Dave Roberts mm -hmm. after they axed Bud Black. And Dave Roberts is the all-time leading percentage winner of managers in Dodger history. Wow. And that includes <laughs> Lasorda. And that includes the great Smokey Alston. So... I don't, I don't know that they hit the eject button on this guy right now. And John, by the way, John is the one that threw the hand grenade towards Petco Park's executive offices because John said if Preller fires Melvin, Preller should be fired too. Yeah, I, I think so. Because he, he, you know, he was, well, the first manager was Bud Black, and you figure, okay, he, had, he got Matt Kemp and the Upton brothers, and it didn't work, and they moved on. All right, you say, okay. Then he did this Andy Green, you know, hire. And we were like, oh, this is interesting. Maybe he could be a good guy. That ultimately failed. The third manager was the guy that filled Chase in. Chase Tingler. 
Oh, well, there was another guy, the guy that filled in for like a month. 15 minutes. Yeah, and he's now, I think, Pat with the Murphy. Brewers. Pat Murphy. Yeah. yeah, that was ridiculous. And then he, this the deal was Tingler was a reach. And everyone was saying, okay, let's trust Preller. You knew him from Texas. That failed. Okay, and then you go and get the guy that is probably the most respect in the league in Melvin. There is no next manager for Preller, in my opinion. Um, so I don't know. I still have a hard time blaming Preller or br blaming Melvin. They have, they have some blame, but th it ultimately comes down to the players and their desire to win and their ability to make adjustments in this game because Machado's still striking out on that, that slider down and away. Okay. John's of the opinion that the players will solve this situation. Well, right. I don't know if they'll solve it, but that's where the blame goes is they to the players. Better solve it. Hey, listen, we hope you've enjoyed what we do.